Hello, YouTube humans. Welcome to Casual Friday here on the Digital Charcuterie channel. It's me, your old bald pal, Andrew Fantasia. And today we're talking Ghostbusters, we're talking Sonic the Hedgehog, we're talking lots of stuff. But before we do that, we're going to talk We Were Wizards. Have you guys ever heard of We Were Wizards? It's this really, really cool new fantasy franchise. And the reason you probably haven't heard of We Were Wizards is because it's not that popular yet. Let me show you We Were Wizards right now. This is it right here. And it was written by me. That's right. It is a fantasy adventure novel series of which there are already two with many more to come. It's going to be 20 when it's all said and done because I'm insane. But anyway, the first two exist right now and you can buy them on Amazon. That's where I have self-published them. The first one is this purple one called Seekers of the Stones. And then the next one is this silver one called Ghosts of Wizards Past. Both books are available in hardcover, as you can see here, in paperback and in ebook. And yes, I promise, James, I am working on getting a version for Cabo as well. And maybe at some point, if I can find a place to record where there's actual, you know, silence instead of people stomping around above me, maybe even an audiobook in the future. But right now, We Were Wizards is available on Amazon all over the world. And if you pick up a copy for yourself or for another fantasy fan in your life, it would help me out a lot. It would also help me out even more if you leave a nice little review on Amazon so that it does not bury me in its cold, merciless algorithm. So check out We Were Wizards right now on Amazon.com all over the world and pick up your copy today for the fantasy fan in your life. But enough shameless plugging or shameful plugging. I don't know how I feel. I've got maybe like 2% shame right now. Let's talk about Ghostbusters Firehouse, which is the working title, or I think just Firehouse is the working title, of the Ghostbusters Afterlife sequel. Now, we're all Ghostbusters fans here, at least James and I are. Anyway, we love them to pieces. We loved Ghostbusters 1. We loved Ghostbusters 2. I have a soft spot in my heart for Ghostbusters 2016. And we also loved Ghostbusters Afterlife. Beautiful franchise. We can't wait for the next one, which is supposedly coming out at the end of this year, even though that feels I don't know, I feel like this movie's gonna get delayed. Like it's being filmed right now, which means they have less than six months to finalize all of the CGI and everything. I, it feels like it's gonna be just under the wire. I would not be surprised if this movie gets delayed, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about this sequel and what it might actually be called. Because here's the thing, Firehouse is just the name of the working title even though it sounds like it could fit. I like the idea of calling it Firehouse, but that's not my personal ideal title for the next Ghostbusters film. I do have an ideal title for it. I'm sure lots of people do. Maybe it's the same one as I'm thinking. So here's what I feel about the title of the Afterlife sequel. Because of what Afterlife had to offer, um, which was a lot of good stuff. And because of what the first two movies offered and taking all that into account and taking into account the years and years people spent waiting for the Ghostbusters third movie that never ended up happening until now, recently, I think, maybe I'm alone on this, maybe some of you agree with me, but I think the perfect title for this upcoming 2023 Ghostbusters film should be Ghostbusters 3. Now, hear me out. Hear me out, okay? That sounds like it's, um, you know, it sounds like it's pooing on what Afterlife did. It sounds like it's brushing Afterlife aside and saying, that's not real. This is real. That's not what I mean when I say this should be called Ghostbusters 3 because I love Afterlife. In fact, I'm going to make a bold statement that Afterlife is the most emotionally satisfying, well-written Ghostbusters film across the board. Boom, there it is, I said it. We all love part one, I love part two, right? We all adore those 80s films and they're wonderful and they're classic and they'll forever be in our hearts. But let's face it, 
they're not the most emotional films. They're just dry jokes for a hundred minutes, which is fine. That's not an insult. That's just, they are what they are. They were not emotionally satisfying movies. They were just vehicles to have people like Bill Murray and Harold Ramis make their trademark dry humor with some fun, creative ghost stuff sprinkled in there. Now we get Afterlife and it's that, but it's also a very sweet, endearing story that's actually getting emotional responses out of us. So that's how I feel about Afterlife. It is just that kind of movie. It elevates Ghostbusters into something it hasn't been before, but it absolutely could keep being. So why do I think Ghostbusters 3 is the perfect title? Because Afterlife was still, even though it's a great movie, it feels like Afterlife is about the band getting back together. Ghostbusters 1 and 2 are the band. It's them playing. It's their two studio albums. Everybody loves them and it's great. And yay, listen to all this wonderful music about ghosts that people ain't afraid of. No, that doesn't make any sense. And then Afterlife comes along many, many, many years later and says, okay, that band is no longer together, but here's these other people doing amazing covers of what the band did. And it's so good that in the universe, it gets the band back together. Now we can actually have the third studio album. Now we can have Ghostbusters 3. And it will still involve McKenna Grace and Finn Wolfhard and Paul Rudd, but it'll also involve Ernie Hudson and God willing, you know, Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray and somehow get Sigourney Weaver in there for more than just a little cameo get Annie Potts back in there, get Lewis Tully if it's possible. I don't even think that is, but, you know, see what we can do because these photos that have been released promise the return of Walter Peck. I almost called him Gregory Peck, which would have been a totally different movie. But Walter Peck is back in this sequel. And from the looks of things, we also get a little taste of Ernie Hudson going through the trunk of his car for something, and we get a little taste of Paul Rudd hiding the fact that he's wearing a Ghostbusters uniform by wearing this cloak and hood, so he looks like he's joining the neighborhood watch cult from Hot Fuzz. Uh, so the pictures don't really reveal much other than the fact that we got Walter Peck, which is very fun. But now, now that we have the band back together, now that it really truly feels like the legacy sequel that legacy sequels tend to be, right? Now that it's actually bringing everything back, it's set in New York again, the characters are all coming back for hopefully more than just cameos, we can officially call this Ghostbusters 3. And again, that's not to say that the characters we met in Afterlife are not real Ghostbusters. Far from it. In fact, I want them to come back and still be a main part of the team. I just love the idea that Afterlife was about getting the band back together. And now that it is back together with new members who are very welcome in this guy's heart, we can officially make it the third studio album of this ghost hunting band and just call it Ghostbusters 3. That's how I feel. I don't know how you feel. Let us know in the comments below. But that to me, in a perfect world, them calling that 3 would get such a pop of pleasure and delight out of the audience even if in this case the audience is just this guy. I can't think of any other lame, cheesy subtitle that they could put in there that would have as much effect as Ghostbusters 3. It would. There is no title they could possibly put that would make more emotional and satisfying sense than just calling it 3. There, I can't think of a single one. And boy, have I tried. Trust me. So... That's how I feel about this sequel. I really hope it's called that. And until, you know, a few months from now when we get our first teaser, we're just going to have to wait and see. But in the meantime, I'm going to switch over and answer some fan emails because I love when fans send emails. We love it here on Digital Charcuterie. And if you want to send an email to us and ask us a question, ah, and ask a, a question, talking is hard sometimes, we will answer it uh, to the best of our ability here on Casual Friday whenever we get a chance. So here we go. This email comes from MJ. Hi, MJ. MJ says, hello, do you think the new Knuckles movie will move from Paramount Plus to theaters after the success 
of Mario. Thanks for your question, MJ. Um, well, Knuckles movie. First of all, I'm excited if this is the case because I thought, I didn't hear much about the Knuckles project. All I know is Adam Pally is in it and Tika Sumter is back, but I thought this was going to be a limited series um, and not a movie. And frankly, you know, I, I'm guilty. Like I, I love and watch the Mandalorian. I have loved and watched all the Marvel shows, etc. But frankly, I want us to stop relying on limited series to grow our franchises. We can, I think we can do better than that. Let's just make movies. Can we please just make more movies and less shows? So if this is in fact going to be a movie and not a show like I originally thought, that makes me way more excited about the Knuckles story than I would have been if it was just a show. Uh, having said that, that's just my own weird bias. Maybe, MJ, maybe it started off as a show, but the Mario success is making the people at Paramount and the people at Sega rethink their strategy. In which case, I'd say go for it. But here's the problem. And problem is not the right word, but here is the issue that the, the good people behind the Sonic movies need to remember. Mario has a vast world of characters and locations and whatever to work from in its library, right? It has the Mushroom Kingdom, it has all the Koopas and Goombas and the Boos and the Shy Guys. Like there's so much in the Mario universe that you can squeeze into this franchise. Sonic, arguably, has even more. You know, between the Saturday morning cartoon that was way better than it had any right to be, and between the Sonic and Knuckles comics that came out of the 90s that were also better than they needed to be, the Sonic world is pretty incredibly detailed. And there's a lot of stuff going on. I have a Knuckles comic that I randomly was given as a little kid. And that comic was full of so much lore of, you know, Mobius and the floating islands and Angel Island and all that stuff. So much Sonic and Knuckles lore that that one issue, those 22 pages, whatever, had me, like, I was floored. I was obsessed with the world of Sonic and I was trying to get my hands on more to dive more into it because it was like Star Wars levels of deep. And Mario, for all its wonderful charm, doesn't quite touch the levels that that Sonic world was building in this comic. And exploring that with the characters that they've given us in these first two Sonic movies would be beautiful. But here's the thing, with this Knuckles project, it doesn't sound like they are. It sounds like it's just Knuckles in the real world, hanging out with Adam Pally, sitting in an olive garden, talking about being a hero. And I think it would be to Sonic's benefit to embrace the more weird, cartoony, fantasy aspects of the Sonic universe. And this doesn't sound like it. So if Knuckles and the team behind this Knuckles show was smart, MJ, or at least, you know, if I was them, I'm not saying I'm smart, but I'm saying if I was on the team of the Knuckles show or movie, I would want to just, you know, I love you, Adam Pally. I love you, Tika Sumter, but I don't want to see Knuckles interacting with Olive Gardens anymore. I don't want to see Sonic running down the I-94. Let's get them back in the Sonic world and play in that world because there is so much there. Uh, and I hope if the people at Sega take away anything from the success of the Super Mario Brothers movie, I hope it's that. I hope they look at that movie and say, hey, you know what? Yes, they started off in Brooklyn, but they spent most of their time in the Mushroom Kingdom, and that worked. And that made us want to play in the Mushroom Kingdom more. I hope that's the takeaway. And moving forward, Sonic 3, Knuckles, whatever projects they have cooking, take us back into that beautiful world and let us play in the sheer colorful absurdity that is whatever Knuckles' universe is called, if it's still called Mobius or whatever, because that's where we want to play. We're, we've had two movies where it was basically the Smurfs with Sonic. We're good now. We're good. Let's step out of that and get back into a place that's more imaginative. That's how I feel. And I hope 
that's how the people at Sega and Paramount feel. Thank you for your question, MJ. All right, next up, this email comes from Emily. Emily says, hi, do you think Ben Solo will appear in the Ray Star Wars movie? I don't see the post story of Ray without Ben. Okay, let's talk about Ben Solo. I'm gonna make a confession right now. This might uh, lose me some respect in certain pockets of the Star Wars fandom. I have never in my entire life as a person who watches stories in film and, and TV and, and reads them in books, I have never ever shipped characters, not once. Not even a little bit. I, I just, I don't, I don't have, I, I'm missing the part of my brain. Like I've never looked at two characters, two fictional people and said, I really want you two to sleep together. Please, that's never happened to me. I must be missing the part of the brain that, you know, takes joy out of that. I've never even done that with two real people as far as I can think. That's just not how I operate. I don't ship. So the whole Raylo thing just brushes right off me. I don't care for it. Uh, however, I care about Ray as a character, and I care about Ben as a character. And I think seeing Ben's Force Ghost visit Ray, not all the time, you know, just like in the same amount of, of instances as, say, Obi Wan's Force Ghost visited Luke, absolutely. Absolutely, Emily, that would be awesome. I don't know if Ben had the training to learn to be a force ghost, but I'm pretty sure Luke would have passed him on. I mean, if Anakin can be a ghost, Ben can be a ghost. It's it's fine. So I don't want to get caught up in that little bit of, well, actually, because I, you know, that's not an issue for me. Uh, but yes, in the context of, hey, this guy who, who helped me out, whatever, now he's a force ghost, he's talking to me, sure. Let's absolutely have him in there. Adam Driver is an awesome actor. I'm sure he'd be interested in coming back in a cameo form because he's a busy guy. So maybe not there as much as he was as Kylo Ren, which makes total sense. But yeah, that's how I think it would work best. Ray is busy. Ray's got her own thing going on. She's got this Jedi Academy that she's probably trying to start. She doesn't have time to just sit around and talk to ghosts all day. So it shouldn't be the Ray and Ben show. It should be the Ray show. And then, you know, during one episode of the Ray show, Ben shows up and everybody in the audience is like, Woo! right? He rings the doorbell. She opens it. Ben! And the audience breaks into applause and he waits for the applause to stop before he says, hey, I was in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know why Star Wars turned into an 80s sitcom just now, but hey, I would not say no to that. But that's how I feel. Um, I know that the Raylo community has a different feeling in regards to why and how often Ben should show up in these new movies. But like I said, I'm not a Raylo person. I am not a shipper person, period. I just, I don't look at two people and say, please screw each other. That's not how I roll. So I'm, just happy with Ben showing up as a ghost, helping her through whatever she has to deal with, and then moving on because I want this to just be Ray's story. And, you know, ideally it'd be nice if Finn was there too and Poe because I love the three of them together as friends. Uh, so it'd be nice to see them again. Ben, his arc is complete. He's good. He can be there now, literally in spirit. Thanks so much for your question. And the final question for today comes from... Kirby Smithson, hello Kirby, who says, do you think the new cameo in The Flash is Blue Beetle? Hmm. Yes, apparently the Flash ending has seen some changes happen to it. In this Flash movie, folks, let's talk about this Flash movie. Ever since, this is going to sound so strange, but it's true, ever since first Suicide Squad, ever since David Ayer's Suicide Squad. The Flash movie has been this thing that was 
supposed to exist, this nebulous thing out there in the cosmos that I knew they were working on, and it was so far out of reach, but it was coming. It was coming. They promised the Flash movie is coming and it's going to be a big deal. That was 2016. It is now 2023. That, what is that, seven years? Yes, sorry. It took me a little moment to do my slow math here. But yes, seven years of knowing this film was looming on the horizon and that it was going to be not just another superhero film, but a big game changer film. I have been just on pins and needles about what this movie could possibly be like and how it's going to bridge the gap, the ever widening gap, if Twitter is any indication, between the initial Zack Snyder universe and this new James Gunn universe. And there is no more perfect film to do so because Flash in the comics has always been about doing that. When they wanted to go from New 52 to Rebirth, they did Flashpoint. Or was it the other way around? I can't remember. When they wanted to go from mm, something to something else, they did Flashpoint. And when they wanted to go from the pre-crisis to the post-crisis, they did Crisis. And guess who was the main character of Crisis and who moved everything along? I'll give you a hint. His name rhymes with Sash. So the Flash movie is going to act in the same regard whether it's adapting Flashpoint, which it looks like it is, or whether it's going to pull from a lot of stuff, it will hopefully give audiences some kind of closure and spell out once and for all what's being carried over across the chasm into the James Gunn world. From the looks of things, that'll probably just include Suicide Squad, the new one, and Aquaman, question mark? So will Blue Beetle be part of that. Is Blue Beetle going to be in this new scene? I think that it's very likely. I think it's very likely. The only other thing it could possibly be is something new we haven't seen yet. That's the only other, you know, option here. Because Blue Beetle makes sense if they want to make this movie matter. That was sadly the problem with Shazam. And I say problem, and I don't mean this as a knock against the movie. I mean this as a knock against the fans who didn't bother seeing the movie. And that includes me. I'm knocking myself here because I didn't, you know, I went to the movies and I could either see Shazam or I could see, um, what did I watch that day? Something else, something that wasn't Shazam. Brother. So I chose to go see Brother. Um, And the problem with that is so many people are, they feel like, the time they invested into the DCEU was not being rewarded. So why bother seeing Shazam? And that was partially my reasoning too. I was like, I can go see the superhero movie that'll probably be streaming in like two weeks, or I can go see this Canadian low budget feature that I would much rather support because who knows when I'll get the chance to see it again because it's leaving the theaters in like 45 minutes. So I went to go see Brother. And Brother was pretty great. Um... So yes, I'm guilty of not seeing Fury of the Gods as well. But a lot of people, I feel, just opted out of Fury of the Gods because they're like, well, DC doesn't know what they're doing or it feels like they don't care about what came before, so why should we? And in a way, I understand that, even though it would be nice if we went to go see movies just for the merit of those movies themselves and just let the cinematic universe of of it all just be icing on the cake rather than the cake itself. But I digress. So if people want, if DC rather wants people to care about Blue Beetle more than they cared about Shazam, makes sense to put Blue Beetle in the Flash movie. Because the Flash movie is going to get views. It's going to get butts and seats. It's going to do way better than Shazam did. Even though Shazam is a sequel to a movie that did exceptionally well and Flash is, you know, for more or less, a new property. There has never been a Flash movie yet. Flash is going to make tons more money because it's just that much more of an event film. So if they want Blue Beetle to matter, throwing him in that movie is the best way to do so. It's the best way to tell people, hey, go invest your time and money in Blue Beetle because we promise he's not going to be erased by Zaslav at the end of the summer like Batgirl was. 
he's going to carry forward into the new James Gunn world. So that would be in their best interests to let the fans know. And if it's not Blue Beetle, it would have to be somebody that we haven't met yet, like somebody from the authority or something to once again, help bridge that gap between the old and the new. But I think, um, according to your question, I think Blue Beetle is probably the most likely, I'd say 80% likely that we see Mr. Beetle, Jaime Reyes, in that Flash film. Plus they're both like young superheroes, so it makes sense, they'd be pals, they would meet up and find common ground. So that's how I feel about this Flash situation. That movie's only two months away now, which is crazy to think about, that it's finally going to be real. Uh, but anyway, that is Casual Friday for today. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed spending some time with me casually here on this Friday afternoon. We'll see you all again next time. And until then, may you please, for the love of God, be the masters of your own